Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about the living world. Today's topic is going to be the endocrine glands, and as I've just made my intro that I always make today, I realize I always say good morning when you're probably watching this at night. So if it is evening for you, good evening. Anyway, let me get you your objectives, and we'll get going for the day. So there's just one of them. And that is to compare and contrast the functions of various endocrine glands and their hormones. Now, what we're going to do today is we're just going to go through several endocrine glands, the hormones they release, and the effects of those hormones. So that's going to kind of be the running theme. Make sure that at the end of the video, you can talk about each of the things that we've kind of run through today. So we're just going to hit it right off the bat. So first thing is the parathyroid glands, which release parathyroid hormone. Now, look at the name, para. Thyroid, you're going to assume, all right, it's probably on the thyroid gland. If you remember, the thyroid gland wraps around the trachea. Those parathyroid glands, there are four of them. They hang out right here and then over on the opposite side. And there are several things that the parathyroid glands do, but one of the big things they do is release parathyroid hormone, which is in charge of blood calcium levels. Now, blood calcium levels are really important for a lot of cellular function, especially like muscle contraction and nerve signaling. So parathyroid horn, hormone is responsible for that uh, level of blood calcium. And the way it does that is it secretes a pair of antagonistic hormones. And what they do is they either cause the body to release calcium or take it up. So a couple of strategies. <clears throat> so first one is through the bones. If blood calcium levels are low, the body will stimulate the bones to break down a little bit and release calcium into the bloodstream. If there is too much calcium in the bloodstream, then another hormone will be released that will stimulate the bones or that will stimulate bone formation, which will take calcium out of the bloodstream. Another strategy is through the kidneys. The kidneys can be stimulated to either excrete calcium or to store calcium. And then finally, there's vitamin D. Vitamin D is a vitamin that is synthesized in the skin when it's exposed to sunlight. And the effect of vitamin D is it gets converted into I believe a hormone that causes the large intestine to absorb calcium ions. So two antagonistic hormones working, one set of hormones causes the body to hold on to calcium, the other set of body of hormones causes the body to get rid of calcium, and both of those come from the parathyroid glands. Next up on the hit parade is the adrenal glands, if we'll go there. There we go. I guess I should probably get rid of my circles too. So the adrenal glands. As far as where they are located, I ran across this diagram, really liked it, it makes things pretty clear. The adrenal glands, they sit up here on top of the kidneys. Um, they're actually a two-part gland, so kind of like we talked about, the pituitary gland has got a neuroendocrine side and a true endocrine side. Same thing on the uh, adrenal glands. If you take the adrenal glands and cut them in half, they're shaped kind of like that. There are two distinct portions to the adrenal glands. There is the outer section known as the adrenal cortex, that would be this piece, and then there's the inner section that is known as the medulla. Um, the cortex, this outer part, is the true endocrine portion. We'll talk about what each one does in a second, but it's the endocrine portion, so it responds to hormones and it sends out hormones. And then the medulla, this inner part, is neuroendocrine, so that means that it responds to signals from the nervous system. Regarding response, let's talk about what each one actually does. So you got a better diagram up there on the top of the screen. Speaking of the medulla, the medulla's big thing is release of epinephrine and norepinephrine, also known as adrenaline and noradrenaline. And you've probably heard a million times, adrenaline is the hormone that is responsible for the fight or flight response, and it has a ton of effects on the body. So signal hits the brain, that brain sends the signal down the nervous system, which is wired into the medulla stimulates the release of adrenaline. Once that adrenaline's in the body, it does several things. Um, it constricts blood vessels such that blood flow to like the digestive tract and the kidneys is restricted and blood flow is rerouted to skeletal muscles and the brain and the heart. Um, it increases heart rate, it takes care of blood pressure, and it essentially uh, releases or gets the body to release a bunch of glucose into the bloodstream. So it causes the liver to break down glycogen, releasing glucose. So it's getting the body ready to respond to a highly stressful situation known as a fight or flight response. And 
that's its gig. Um, so remember that adrenaline is also known as epinephrine or noradrenaline is known as norepinephrine and those come from the adrenal medulla get the body ready for the fight or flight response. The other half of our adrenal gland is the cortex that's going to be the outer section and the cortex um, secretes two classes of hormones known as glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids. Glucocorticoids deal with the amount of glucose in the bloodstream and one of the things that they do is they actually stimulate the breakdown of muscle protein and then that muscle protein that is broken down gets further broken down into glucose that the body can use as fuel. Now in a stressful situation or in a situation where your body needs more food this is you know it's a good situation it's a way for your body to get some glucose without having to burn fat or glycogen or take an extra food but it also leads to the breakdown of your muscles over time. And then there are mineral corticoids, and these deal with the uh, levels of minerals and ions in your blood, so that's going to have a lot to do with osmosis and diffusion. Um, know that that glucocorticoid cortisol um, is a stress hormone that, if it circulates in the body too much, can lead to a lot of inflammatory response. It can lead to muscle breakdown. Um, it's good in small quantities when your body needs it, but if you're in a constantly stressful situation where your body has high levels of cortisol all the time, probably not the best situation for the body. And we've got the gonads, which are responsible for sex hormones. So gonads would be ovaries in females, testes in the males, and there are basically three classes of gonad sex hormones, the androgens, the estrogens, and the progestins. I'll just kind of go, I've got a list on the right, right there of androgen hormones. Androgen hormones are going to be hormones that are responsible for male sex characteristics or male characteristics. Now know that males and females have all three of these hormones, it's just the proportions of them are vastly different. So in males, the androgens are going to be the most, I guess, dominant or proportionally greatest uh, proportion of the hormones. Uh, the androgen that is best known is testosterone, and these are responsible for development of secondary male characteristics. So that would be sex characteristics. So that would be things like pubic hair, chest hair, um, muscle mass, lower voice, things like that. Estrogens are going to be responsible for female secondary sex characteristics. So again, pubic hair, grows the breasts, things like that. Um, obviously, the most well-known uh, estrogens is going to be estradiol, which is the, I don't know, I guess it's the most predominant or the most known of the estrogens. And then there are progestins, the best known of which is progesterone. And progestins are responsible for the maintenance of the uterine lining during uh, the female cycles. So as you know, females are going through their monthly cycle, the levels of different progestins are rising and falling to maintain the uterine lining. So that would be gonadal sex hormones. And next up on the list, we've got endocrine disruptors. Now, obviously, this is not a gland. We're just going to kind of finish up with a couple of, I guess, related topics. Um, endocrine disruptors are a class of chemicals that when introduced to the body, they interrupt some ki some kind of hormone information flow and if you look at the diagram here on the right you can see and we've talked a lot about hormones working on a lock and key format where you know the hormone is shaped like the key the receptor is a lock when those two fit together some sort of response happens so you can see our receptor here is set up to accept this hormone an endocrine disruptor would be a chemical that comes in and it fits into the lock, but its shape is different and it causes a different effect in the body. Um, back in the 40s through the 70s, there were several um, medicines that were given to pregnant women that were later found to be endocrine disruptors. They caused very significant birth defects in uh, developing fetuses. It's also been shown that endocrine disruptors in the uh, like in lakes and streams have caused some pretty striking effects in amphibians and fish, such as males that have been feminized. Um, endocrine disruptors have also been shown to lead to lower sperm counts in men. So pretty bad set of chemicals. Um, one of them that's been talked about most recently is bisphenol A or BPA. It's used in making plastic. So if you look at a water bottle, a lot of them now say no BPA, which means that they have gotten rid of that endocrine disruptor bisphenol A. Last slide, last topic for the day is biorhythms. And by biorhythms, I am talking about the sleep-wake cycle. Now, buried in the very, very center of your brain is a gland called the pineal gland. It is right there. And its major function is to secrete melatonin. 
Melatonin is a hormone that regulates our sleep and wake cycle. More melatonin, we're sleepy, less melatonin, we're awake. Um, it's generally been shown that the pineal gland secretes melatonin in response to light. So as things go dark in the evening, that kind of stimulates the pineal gland to start releasing melatonin, which causes you to be sleepy. So that's it. I know that was kind of like fragmented. There was no good story that ran through all of that, but well, when is there ever? So make sure that you can go through and talk about each of those glands and their associated hormones. Make sure that you understand a little bit about how they uh, impact the body or how they work on the body or what they do. I am done rambling now. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. We'll see you again.